want to want to read to you today from John four or Mark fourteen. Sorry, Mark fourteen. Um, a very very familiar story. Um, and as we're going through this, um, just want you to have in mind. This is the same story that both uh, Matthew uh, and, and John record in their gospel, but it's different than the, than the story that we read in Luke 7. Um, similar, similar account, but different. And uh, um, so as we, as we read this, um, we need to understand that it is um, maybe maybe one of the traditional stories we have uh, we have in our mind um, about the um, was uh, at the at, at Simon the Pharisee's house when she took the alabaster box of ointment and uh, anointed Jesus' feet with it. Um, songs written about it. A uh, little bit different story, but this is one that is very similar, but it was also recorded in, in Matthew and, um, and John. Now the Passover and the fest festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill Him. Uh, but not during the, the festival, they said, or people may riot. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table at the home of Simon the leper, a woman with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of pure nard. Um, that just always sounds awesome, pure nard. Uh, I always think lard when I read that for some reason. I two different things. Nard is a perfume extract. Uh, lard is something you cook with that is very yummy but clogs the arteries. Um, made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. Think about that. A year's worth of work. Um, 40 hours a week for uh, 52 weeks was going into to this perfume. That's how much it cost her, regardless of what her standard of living was. A year's worth of work, a year's worth of wages uh, is how much this was worth uh, to her. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare my body for burial. burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them, and they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now, I told you that there was a difference in this story and the one in Luke 7 where the sinful woman poured the perfume on Jesus' feet, wiped it with her hair. We know that, uh, that story. The interesting thing about this one is the other Gospels will tell us that this is actually Mary, the sister of, of Martha and Lazarus. All right, so, so the, the, we know that she was passionate about worshiping Jesus, right? She was passionate. We remember when Jesus went to their house, where was she? She was, she was at Jesus' feet, uh, giving worship to him and listening to his teaching while Martha was in the kitchen. And uh, Martha, of course, complained about it, but Jesus said what she done is, is, is great. There were more needful things right, uh, that needed to be done. And Mary has given herself to those. And here again, she is worshiping Jesus. Uh, so we know that she had a heart for, for worship. And I know we, we're we've short on time, but I just I want to give you I just want to give you five thoughts on on worship um, that that I hope in some way will be impactful and some things that we can pick up from her life. Uh, not hard to see uh, as we as we read through this, uh, but just good reminders. No rocket science here, thank God, because um, 
I would fail, uh, but, but good, good reminders, all right? So let me give you five thoughts. Worship is a personal thing. Like worship is a, is a personal thing. Um, verse number three says, while he was in Bethany reclining at the table uh, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume uh, on his head. We can, we can worship and we can sing songs um, in, a, in a room full of people. We can express ourselves uh, to Jesus in a room full of people. Um, but the truth is, is even when we're in a room full of people and we're singing worship songs unto the Lord, we've all probably have been in those moments at some point in our life, whether it was because things were going on that no one else was knew about, or maybe it was just that, um, life was hard at the time that we were so distracted. Like we were just going through the motions. Like we were just singing the songs along with everyone else, but there was like so there was there was sort of this this meaningful expression this way because we felt like we were doing what everyone else was doing, but there was really no meaningful expression this way. Like there was nothing that was like being given to the Lord. We were just totally going through the motions. Um, we we've all we've all probably been there, right? Because worship is something that is intensely personal. Like, you can fool everybody in this room today. If we start playing a worship song, like, you could lift up your hands. Uh, you could sing out with a great voice. But, but really, um, no one knows but Jesus, who should be the, 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 where our worship is going. No one knows but you and Jesus if worship is really happening or if you're just going through the motions. Now, it's obvious that in that room that there were a lot of people who, who liked being close to Jesus. But we're only told about one that, that night who had a true expression of worship unto the Lord. And, and the truth is that she probably looked like um, one of the, the least likely candidates. If you were to put the mark of uh, spirituality on, on one of the people in the room... She may or may not have been the candidate for the most spiritual looking person in the room. But we know that she had a personal connection with Jesus that night. And we know that none of the other people in this room were talked about in their expression of worship. Worship is something that is extremely personal. Uh, worship is also costly. Uh, we're told in, in verse 5 that the perfume or the nard that she that uh, she, she anointed Jesus with could have been sold for a year's wages. Um, worship, worship cost us something. Um, I heard about a man who stopped by a department store to, to um, get, a, get a gift for his wife. And I uh, said, I'd like to get some perfume, brought out a jar. Of, uh, uh, of perfume, said, how much is it? $100. Said, no, I need something cheaper. Just pulled out another, another uh, jar of perfume and um, said, this one's $50. Said, it just smells great, but I need something cheaper. Pulled out another jar. This one was $35. Smell, this smells great, but I still need something cheaper. So finally, the sales clerk just pulled out a mirror and said, here you go. It's the only thing cheaper in this store is you, buddy. Um, the, the, the truth is, is that many times we come before the Lord and we just sort of bring them our leftovers, right? Uh, whether, it's our, whether it's our money, well, you can have, I'm going to use all that I have and give you whatever's left, Lord. Whether it's our energy and worship, uh, we come in after being exhausted all week and we just sort of give this half effort in terms of worshiping God. We just, we don't have much left in the tank, whether it's our day-to-day -day life. But the truth is, is that worship is costly. It always costs us something. Um, and, and here we find that for this lady, financially, it was costing her a lot. 
Um, moving quickly, sorry, sorry I have to rush through this, but number three, uh, worship is often criticized. Um, some of those present were saying indig indig indignantly um, to one another, did I, did I have enough? It, it, it was good? All right. Why, why this waste of perfume? Why this waste of perfume? Here's one of the things that has always boggled my mind in the, in the local church. And I know none of you have this problem, but do you know that one of the biggest problems, at least in the church in America over the last 20 to 30 years, one of the biggest problems, one of the things that has split more churches than anything is worship style. Worship style. Because the people on the stage didn't sing the kind of songs that a person in the, in the seats or the pews like to hear. They felt it was their right to complain as if those worship songs were about them. The songs are never about you, they're about Jesus. That's why as believers, we should be able to walk into a room that has music that doesn't meet our stylistic preferences, and we should be able to worship Jesus with it. Why? Because it's not the songs that are being sung. Jesus is the object of our affection. So it matters not if stylistically we are being pleased, but is Jesus being praised? And, and, and that, that should be our goal. But so many times when we worship the Lord, we find that there is a criticism that can follow it. Right? We find this in the Old Testament with David as he worshiped before the Lord when the Ark of the Covenant came in. And Michael came down and, and criticized him. Because he was, so, he was so just exorbitant in his, in his praise and his worship. The Bible says he even danced naked before the Lord. Don't try that here, all right? Um, but, but David said, I've become even more undignified than this. David was saying, I'm not going to let your criticism dissuade me from praising my God. So I challenge you, like when we come into these chapel times, when we come into staff worship times, let's not let who's around us dictate the praise that is going up because it doesn't matter what they would think of us. It matters what is happening in this direction with our Lord. The last two, very quickly, worship is... Um, uh, I printed from Tyra's printer and it printed front and back and I'm used to, uh, yeah, not used to that. All right, worship is, is prophetic. We're told here that this lady was preparing Jesus' body for burial for us. You think about the prophetic statement that is being made every time we worship the Lord. Just like in communion, just like in communion, when we take of that sacrament, when we worship the Lord, we are, we are declaring all that Jesus is, all that Jesus has done, but we are also saying we are not serving a dead Savior. We are serving a living Savior. We are giving worship to a living Savior. And not only are we giving worship to Him, but we're giving worship to one who will come back and re rescue us from the depravity of this world, we are making a prophetic statement, no matter what we're going through, that our Savior will rescue us from the depravity of this world. And every time we worship Him, we're not just worshiping Him for who He is and what He's done, but we're also looking forward to the fact that we have an eternity to spend with our Savior. And lastly, worship is honored. God always honors the heartfelt worship of his people. He said in verse 9, I tell you that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, that what this lady has done will, will also be told. I believe God honors a heart of worship towards him. And that looks different, right? I mean, it's, it's not like we know how, what God is going to do. If you worship God, you're going to get this or you're going to get that. No. But God honors, God honors the worship um, of his people. When we give him our best in worship, I believe God honors that in ways that sometimes we can't even describe. We can't even, we can't even put a finger on it. We just know that God honors the praises of his people. In fact, the Bible tells us 
one of the ways that he honors that, right, is God dwells in the praises of his people. When I was in Russia, the pa a, a pastor was talking about this, this particular verse, and he said that the way it's translated in, in, in his language was that when, when we praise God, he pulls up a chair in our midst and sits down. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful, what a beautiful thought. I thought, what if, we, what if we approached every act of worship like that? When we worship the Lord, He pulls up a chair in the midst of our situation and takes residence right where we're at. Wow, that's beautiful to me. Well, let's pray and, and we'll get out of here. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are and all that you've done for us, and we do give you praise. May we walk in a lifestyle of worship and praise before you, Lord, declaring who you are, uh, what you've done, and all that you have said you would do. We love you, and we thank you for this in your strong name. Amen. Bless you guys.